and he'll be speaking today about uh, a pretty neat technique that he's developing here or expanding on, uh, and that's the uh, feasibility of fish and wildlife assessments using close chain market capture. Thanks, Kurt. Um, yeah, as Kurt said, I'm going to talk about something that I think has some really cool potential uh, for expanding what kind of populations we can survey and what we can learn about populations, uh, both in terms of things we couldn't get to before or things we couldn't afford to in terms of time or money. Um, before I go into that, though, I want to start by acknowledging all the various people involved, and there are others who I'm sure I forgot to put on this list, um, both on the sampling side of things, uh, and then also those at Cornell who helped me with my deep dive into genetics, um, which has been really rewarding. Before I start talking about what close kin market capture is, I'm going to give a brief refresher on standard market capture, so we're all on the same page when I compare the two. Um, this is as basic as it gets, Lincoln-Peterson model. You've got some sort of population represented here by the classic little marbles, and we want to know something about them, uh, usually how many are out there. So we collect a sample, we mark that sample somehow, we throw them back, let them mix up, and then we take another sample. And our proportion of marked individuals in that second sample versus the size of that sample, the size of the first sample, how many we know we marked, gives us an estimate of the total number of whatever size class or group of individuals we were marking. Uh, this works pretty well. There's a reason why this is the go-to method for figuring out true abundance. Uh, if you want to go beyond relative abundance and CPUE and other indices. Uh, however, there is one major problem, which is the reason why there's a plethora of different designs and models. Uh, and this is capture heterogeneity. Uh, that is anything about your marked sample that differs from the actual population in a way that's systemic and that you have not accounted for in your model. Uh, this can happen from your sample not reflecting the actual population or from some sort of change in your marked population, in your samples, um, throughout time. So in the first case, this could be size selectivity. Let's say you're using gill nets. They're really good at capturing 500 millimeter fish. Most of the fish you get are that. You mark them, you throw them back. When you go out to net again, you mostly get 500 millimeter fish, and you're missing all the other fish that go right through that net. Uh, this still tells you something about the population. It might not be what you think it is, but it contains useful information that if you can parse out what's happening, you can use this. A little bit more dangerous form of capture heterogeneity is when your marked population changes. This might be differential survival. You stick giant tags in them, the tagged fish die more often than normal fish do. And when you go out to resample, you're not getting a whole lot of recaptures. And it's not because your population is huge, it's because you killed off all your tagged fish. Uh, another classic thing on the other side is the trap happy individuals. Um, so this often happens with small mammal trapping. You go out, set some traps, bait them with peanut butter, get some chipmunks, you mark them, you put them back. The next day you come back and man, you have tons of recaptures. It's not that you have a tiny population, it's that you've taught a small group of chipmunks that peanut butter is delicious. <laughs> this is tougher to figure out what's happening and it doesn't tell you anything. It's telling you how you have changed the population not what's actually out there that you're trying to learn about. So that's the glaring problem with traditional market capture. But what about close kin market capture? Well, close kin market capture is a genetic market capture technique. Um, you've probably heard that term. But not all genetic market capture is created equal. Uh, most of it is simply replacing traditional marks with genotyping. We're not going to stick tags in them. We're just going to take fin clips, hair samples, something that we can tell from one sample to another, hey, these genotypes match up. That must be the same individual we saw again. Close kin market capture goes a little bit deeper. Uh, so our sample are not a bunch of independent individuals. They're actually all interrelated on some level, just like all of us in this room at some level are related to each other. Um, and in the size of populations we deal with, they're often essentially families present. And genotyping can reveal those relationships. So there might be a baby and a mom and a dad. Um, 
that contains information about the overall size of the population. Uh, and we can use those observed relationships to actually get an estimate of total population size, um, which has some really interesting possibilities. So how do we do this? Uh, first of all, we look at the ages in our sample, and that determines what might be potential pairs. So what we're trying to find is pairs of a potential offspring and a potential parent. Uh, and if you know something about age of maturity, you can say, hey, this fish was born in 2018, this fish was mature in 2018, that might be a parent offspring pair. We put all those together as potential pairs, and then we use genotyping and heritage estimation to determine the actual pairs. So in this sample, we have two real pairs versus five or six potential pairs. Essentially, we can think about this as marker capture, where each juvenile or younger individual marks two older individuals. And that number two is really important. Because we know there are exactly two parents, yay, sexual reproduction, standard throughout most of the animal kingdom, uh, and we also know that an adult that we sampled today was also alive back when that juvenile was spawned. Uh, we can actually estimate the number of adults that could have potentially been spawners that were present in the population at the time of the juvenile spawning. So just to sum up there, two marks, they're applied at spawning, so we're actually essentially capturing and recapturing at the time of spawning. Um, and since we know that adults and juveniles that we sampled today were also alive back then, we don't have to worry about mortality. We can condense this down and say that the probability of any potential pair being a true pair is the number of parental roles, that's two, over the number of potential parents that could have filled those roles. A little more mathy version here, our probability is two over the number of adults at the time the juvenile was spawned. And flipping that around, that gives us this very simple looking estimator where it's two times your number of juveniles in your sample times your number of potential parents over the number of actual parents that you saw. And that is what you need for an estimate. Okay, so that works. You can get numbers out of this. What about capture heterogeneity? Uh, does that affect this? The answer is yes, to a certain degree, but much less than with traditional mark recapture. So if the frequencies of the parent offspring pairs in your sample is not representative of the true number or frequency of parent offspring pairs, then you have problems. But this requires some covariate that affects both the juvenile and the adult. Because unlike normal market capture, where we are capturing and recapturing the same individual, in this case, capture and recapture are two separate individuals. And whatever is screwing up our estimation has to affect both of them. Um, so what might do this? So if you have, say, size-related fecundity, and you're using some sort of size-selective gear that picks out very fecund or not at all fecund individuals, that might give you some problems. Uh, if three-year-olds contribute most of the offspring in the population, and your nets mostly capture three-year-olds, then what you're gonna get is an estimate of the number of three-year-olds out there, not an estimate of the total adult population. Um, but as with traditional market capture, this form of capture heterogeneity is still useful. If three-year-olds are doing most of your spawning, and that's what your estimate is really going down to, that's a number you want to know. And you could, once again, parse it out and say, well, okay, let me estimate it for three-year-old potential parents, four-year-old potential parents, five-year-old potential parents, and you would get a number for each, or you would get, you know that, for example, six-year-olds didn't show up in your sample at all, so you can't get any estimates about them, but you know that three-year-olds are contributing a lot to the population. Um, sampling at time of spawning, might give you some sort of bias because you'll regress down to the spawning population as opposed to the total adult population. 
Um, and then if you're working with some species where the juveniles hang out with their family, with their parents over time, that would screw things up. If your net captures a little family that are all related to each other, then you're gonna get an estimate for a tiny population, which is the size of that family. Um, but that's pretty rare in most cases. Uh, in general, this is much more robust to capture heterogeneity than with traditional marker capture. Uh, the tricky part about this is that it's pretty untested. Uh, a guy named Mark Robinson really started coming up with this um, with, along with Hans Skog in uh, Norway and Eric Anderson up in California um, in about 2015. They've used this for southern bluefin tuna. It's being used for white sharks. Uh, I just got a um, job posting to do close kin market capture with black bears in Michigan. So it's starting to get out there. Uh, but this is very few cases. The number of studies I can probably still count on one hand. Um, so we wanted to validate this in a small freshwater system that's not a one-off with some big marine commercial stuff. And it turned out we actually have the perfect test bed for this. So you've probably heard of a Honondaga Lake if you've been in one of these meetings before. Uh, this is a poster child for acidification. We've been studying brook trout recovery in there for a while, and it's been a big component of my PhD work. Um, and we had actually already been conducting a traditional market capture study and taking tissue samples at the same time. Uh, so when we, I heard about this, I thought this is the perfect situation in which to see how this actually matches up. Quick details about that. Um, we were sampling in the spring every year, 2015 to 2017, so three years total. Uh, that netted us 715 unique fish. Uh, we had pit tags for traditional market capture, and we were using an adipose clip as a secondary mark um, that I was saving as a tissue sample after the first season when I realized that I was wiping away actual data, and I should probably be sticking in files instead. Um, took all those tissue samples, and genotype them using next-gen microsats. So these are traditional microsat markers, but uh, using a sequencer to actually dig into that so we can stack a lot more markers together in a panel. Um, started with 100 candidate loci, knocked that down to 44 that were performing well, that were actually amplifying. Uh, and this turns out to be a pretty cost-effective technique. So from start to finish, with time included there, at a fair rate, it came out to about 650 a sample. Um, and obviously, there's some economies of scale. If you go low, then it's going to cost you more because you have to do some development work. If you go very high, you're going to save money and come down to some basic level. Um, but it worked out pretty nicely. It was effective. And then use service for parentage analysis. There's a few different software packages. There's Colony. There's a thing called CKM Larson now, which was designed for close kid market capture by Eric Anderson. Um, but use this to match up likely parents and offspring. So what happened? What did we get out of this? This is a plot of our estimates um, of close kin market capture here in black, and then our robust design traditional market capture in red. And you can see they match very nicely in terms of magnitude and precision. Uh, close kin market capture gives us estimates for all the year classes in our sample that we can find parents for. So it actually allows us to go back in time. Um, and it only goes to the last spawning occasion, as opposed to traditional market capture, which gives you an estimate of the population size at your last capture occasion. So you can only be as recent as the youngest cohort that you sample. Uh, so they don't match up perfectly. Luckily, we also have been doing some fall sampling where we've been tagging fish, a single sample a year, and we were able to do a rough Lincoln-Peterson from year to year. Uh, and that's shown here by these yellow bars. And you can see that those also match up very well going back in time. Um, down here, when you get a very few pair and offspring pairs, things get a little bit wider. The close kin tends to go towards a lower estimate and be biased low. Um, but in this section here, they once again match up very nicely to the traditional technique. And if you have multiple years of data, and age of maturity is relatively low, you can get estimates of survival from close kin as well, which is a really cool add-on. It's not just abundance. 
Uh, in the case of this, we didn't have very many fish that qualified for what we need to model that. Uh, so we have pretty wide uncertainty, but it's no different from our traditional robust estimates. Uh, it's just as good in this case. So to sum that up, very similar traditional market capture. Uh, provided slightly different estimates, so you're getting the number of mature adults as opposed to the number of taggable size fish. Taggable size would obviously differ depending on your technique, um, whereas mature adults differ depending on the population. But that's a useful number to know. Um, and it's indexed to the spawning season as opposed to the moment that you were sampling. Um, and you do need different sampling needs. You need some sort of age or length data. Um, and it's a minimum of a single sample for close kin market capture as opposed to traditional market capture where you need a recapture occasion. You've got to be out there at least twice. Close kin, your captures and your recaptures, your juveniles and your parents are in the same sample. You might just need one. So I think there are a lot of places this could fit in, maybe just as a replacement for traditional methods. Um, but a few that I'd like to highlight. Remote locations, if, you, if going in there is really tough, you might only want to go in once. You hammer a lake hard, you get a bunch of fish, you've got all you need for good estimates. You don't have to go back. Um, Long-lived species. So <coughs> for lake trout, if you've got good age distribution in your samples, you've got long-lived in, or old individuals in your population, you might be able to find juveniles that are 20 years old and you found a parent for them. That could give you 10, 20 years of population estimates over time. This gives us the opportunity to say, some, wow, something happened. Let me go back and see what was happening with uh, abundance over that period. Usually we don't get that opportunity to look back and say, man, we should have been collecting that data. Because it's more robust to any sort of bias, um, this could be done with Creole surveys of citizen science. Somebody who has length information, a basic estimate of age, and got a fin clip from an angler. You don't really need to know where they were sampling. You don't need to know how much effort they put in. You're putting it all in the same pot, as long as you have an idea of the age there. And then finally, what I call opportunistic analysis. It's not hard to take fin clips. You can sock them away in a freezer and collect thousands of them and maybe only analyze the ones you need to, or any of them when you find the money, or maybe you're not even sure you ever want to look at this, but it's easy to stick a fin clip in a freezer, and 10 years from now, maybe you want to know. And then, last but not least, if this has intrigued you at all, here's my recipe. You need some no-in-age offspring.